This is what I prepared for you. I will speak about language. And to start, I will tell you how I feel and how you know, we should feel when we speak about language. This is the sensation we should have. Speaking of language, at least to me, is like speaking, uh, looking, understanding a starry night. Ideas are the stars, and there are almost infinitely many. What the human brain does when you see a starry night, you inevitably conjoin the points together and you do your own constellation. If you have a lot of fantasy, then you may end up seeing a bear in the sky. I've never succeeded in looking at that. But another interesting fact of the starry night is that when you look at the stars, you know at least that there are stars that are still living and stars that are dead and still send you the light to you. The history of Western civilization, at least, when thinking about human language, is almost the same. There are ideas that never die and still push your mind, your reflection, to that point. And you never know whether one star you're looking at is a lively one or a dead one. You have to have your own constellation, as many as we are here. Who is right, we don't know. We have to use the constellation and try to see where we get to. And now let me get you to the point. Uh, there is a new challenge that everybody is facing in the world nowadays that starts from what we already know about language. We know that language depends on a specific brain activity, at least since the 19th century, when a guy in Paris, 1821, Monsieur Le Bourgne, knocked at the door of the hospital, and when he tried to speak, he lost the dictionary, but, but not the book, the dictionary in the mind. He only had one word, in fact, one syllable, tongue. And so he was kept in the hospital. Uh, they gave him the name Tantan, and he was only speaking with single words. So to say, Che ore sono, he would have said, Tan 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 Tan, of course, with no possibility to understand. Then the disease of this person got worse and worse. He had a paralysis of the right and the right part of the body, and when he died, a person looking at his brain found uh, a ramollissement, un ramollimento, a softening, in fact like a hole in the brain. And this is Tantan's brain. The person who did the autopsy is the well-known, famous Dr. Broca, and the area here is called Broca's area. What is the new challenge we're facing? We are now asking whether the specific rules of language are also controlled by the brain or not. Um, when I, of course, language is a, is a universe. With language, you can cry, you can pray, you can love, you can joke, you can do whatever you like. And then language is made of sound, of gestures, of music. The aspect of language that I'm interested in, and I think there, there is a good reason for that, is syntax. Syntax is the capacity to put the words in the correct order. This is not a new idea. Uh, in fact, the idea that syntax is the fingerprints of human language, um, for example, was stated by Steve Anderson, the head of the linguistics society, American Linguistic Society, when he said, the communication systems of all other known animals, all other animals, that is, we are animals, are based on limited fixed sets of discrete messages and one that cannot be expanded by combining elements to form new and different messages. This seems to be brand new, but in fact, it was exactly the same thing that Descartes said in his method. Now, is it true, aren't there animals who can, you know, put together words in the correct order to communicate thought? I mean, science, of course, always gets through the correct generalization 
are all apples falling down? There is a famous joke that said that, no, yes, all apples fall down because those who fold up are extinct. Well, we don't know, but maybe there are, you know, bees or animals that can speak like us, but at least when they checked with the primate in the 70s, there was a group of people that came up with this paper on science, can a nape create a sentence? They sort of adopted a chimp. The name of the chimp, for those who already know some of the history of linguistics, is fun because it's Nim Chimsky. And the person there, a good friend of mine, Laura Ann Petito, she's a Canadian linguist, lived with a chimp in a house and they talk to each other with sign language. You know, sign language, there are as many sign languages as there are languages in the world. These are perfect grammars. There's no, they're exactly like all the other grammars. The chimp was able to learn up to 128 different words. And then the chimp was trying to make new sentences and they examined 19,000 sentences. There was not a single sentence where the order made the difference. Now, English, Italian, Spanish, whatever language you use in the world, if you say John killed Peter or Peter killed John, the situation changes because the position of an element in a structure may change the interpretation of the structure. Animals cannot do that. Syntax is only for humans. Before going through the experiment, let me tell you and one thing that I find it interesting is why um, did people uh, adopt the idea that um, languages, um, that syntax was not really important? It was because of uh, ideological bias in biology. Ideology is always leading science. And we have to be aware of that when we make the next choice. Let me read you one sentence from the preface of a famous book um, that came out less than 50 years ago. A biological investigation into languages, language must seem paradoxical as it is so widely assumed that languages consist of arbitrary cultural convention. This was uh, the word by Lenneberg in 1967, he was working at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Nowadays, for the students of, of medicine, actually I talked um, to a student of medicine here, Diego, that I met before, and people in all parts of the world, you know, tend to have this kind of book for the first years. If you go to the first chapter of this book, you will find that the idea that language is not a cultural convention is already established. But why was it so useful to think that language could be, could vary in a Babel fashion? Well, that was because during the 50s in the United States of America, especially at the laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there was the idea that a machine could translate one language into another. Remember those years where the years where the war finished, people had a lot of experience in trying to understanding secret cults. Enigma, for example, that was a cult that Alan Turing uh, cracked in, in England, was one of the cases. And the idea there was, let's make a machine, a machine that is able to make statistical calculation. You put a book or several books on the one hand, and on the other, you find the books translated into the other language. Let's hear, in the word of um, Joshua Bachelel, a logician who worked at that department at that time, um, what he said about those ears. There was an ubiquitous and overwhelming feeling around the laboratory at MIT that with new insights of cybernetics and the newly developed techniques of information theory, the final breakthrough towards a full understanding of the complete complexity of communication in the animal and the machine had been achieved. Look at that. Animal and machine. Humans disappears. Humans completely enter into the rare domain of machine, of animals, sorry. In fact, you had only two possible domains. Lively, complex, com complex organisms and artificial, lively, uh, complex organisms. 
But then it happened what always happens in science. When someone tells you, I have completely understood something, um, you can be sure that something went wrong. It happened with physics. The end of the 19th century, people said, well, we just have to adjust some cipher in the gravitational constant and so on and so forth. And then Planck and Einstein came and then overturned the scenario. Same thing happened to linguistics. Someone put together three facts concerning language that showed that we had to start from scratch. First, the complexity of language. Second, the uniformity of that complexity across languages. And third, the spontaneous acquisition of the language by us, by human people. And this was Noam Chomsky who wrote a huge thesis that was <laughs> not to be published, but the little book that changed the world of linguistics in 1957, and this is the central sentence a few years later. The fact that all normal children acquire essentially comparable grammar of great complexity with remarkable rapidity suggests that human beings are somehow especially designed to do this with data handling or hypothesis formulating ability of unknown character and complexity. As you see here, interestingly enough, not only humans come in, but children, and in fact, which is the, the variety of humans which is less keen to make sophisticated statistical calculation. And then you have the idea of a special design for humans, which is nothing but the intuition that Descartes had in the 17th century. And then there is a word that I like a lot when a scientist says that, the word mystery or unknown, which to me is something very interesting to acknowledge. Um, the, the revolution of modern linguistics actually took us to what uh, can be considered the anti-Babel. That is the, the idea that Babel is completely reversed. Syntactic rules, are severely constrained by the same principle in every human language. Uh, the result is, in a sense, is similar to, this is the handwriting Mendeleev chart. The very idea is that, as it happened in physics, where you have different elements that are nothing but the combination of the same bricks in different amounts and different positions, there should be like a periodic table of human languages, something where the rules, the syntactic rules, I'm only talking about syntax, can be generated by a recombination of same elements. Now, to let you understand what has been done, that is, what is the set of universal common principle, I decided to prepare you um, a sort of a, an intermezzo, that is, a place where I try to give you the essential of human syntax. It's not too difficult. In fact, it's surprisingly not too difficult. But it took many years to approach linguistics with a mathematical view. Now, um, what linguists do, at least linguists exist synthetician, is this. Nice, right? They, they could be better color, but... Uh, if you think you, you have to describe this on the phone to a friend of yours, now, I mean, now we can make pictures with phone, but just suppose you have to, to say that, you know, with your own voice, to describe it. It's difficult. You have red dots, violet dots, yellow dots, and there, for example, between the red one in the first case and the red one in the others, there is a middle of, there, there are elements in the middle. And then the linguist does the following thing. It goes there and turns the situation upside down. So what we try to do is to unveil the hidden connection between words that prima facie, when you observe the surface of things, don't show up. But I, don't know, I do not want to be metaphoric. I want to give you a simple case. Now, suppose I give you this sentence, John sings. Perfect sentence, a noun, a verb, a subject, a predicate, a singular, and a singular. It's a perfectly well-formed sentence. If I tell you John Singh, this is not. Still, you have a noun and a verb, a subject and a predicate, but one is singular and the other is plural. You can make your own case 
and Castilian and Italian in any other language that has morphology, of course. But is it true that the sequence John Singh is never observed in any well-informed English sentence? This is not the case. Why not? Because although the glue that links John and Singh is broken, something may happen that keeps them together, provided that something else happens far from these two words. Said in that way is complicated. But if I give you an example, this is very simple. Those who love John Singh. Still, John and Singh are one after the other, but they are perfect now. Why is it so? Because we can actually understand that the sequence is completely different. In one case, is a single sentence. In the other, John belongs to another sentence, and the full sentence contains that sentence. Okay, what you see on the, on the slide here is already the secret heart of human syntax. Namely, something contained in the same type of element. This nesting is a wonderful machinery that we have in our mind, and we do not use it only for linguistics. Take, for example, mathematics. This is a well-known cure called the uh, Van Gogh cure. You take one segment, you divide it in three, and the middle part is substituted by a triangle. Then you do the same thing over and over and over again. So the repetition of something arises at a point where a single part contains the same information as the whole. Now look at this. This structure and this structure are practically implementing the same architecture. In one case you have that the whole contains the same information and then you have that a sentence contains a sentence. There are other cognitive domains where you do these things. Grammar, mathematics and music. But I want to only speak about grammar now, so let you know, take mathematics aside. What is the importance of this fact is that you can isolate a single extremely powerful principle, which is the following, that is valid in all languages of the world. All syntactic rules depend on hierarchy, that is, this nesting as generated by a recursive procedure, that is, the procedures that are infinitely possible, rather than linear order. And if you discover this principle, you immediately have the recipe for an impossible rule. Let me give you one example. Suppose, oh, this is my idea of what is, I mean, of all the images that I tried to find, this one, I can't really understand. There is no I cannot find a point where someone has cut through. If one finds that, please at the end, tell me. But let me give you the example. Peter is a genius. How do we negate this sentence? We insert the word, or my brother is a genius. Peter is a genius, as Peter is not a genius. So we use the word not, and we put it into the sequence. Suppose someone looks at these rules and has to find out how English works. They could say, well, you get an affirmative, a negative sentence from an affirmative one by using the word not inserted as the third word of the sequence. So, for example, the second sentence becomes, my brother not is a genius, which is always wrong. What you do is say, my brother is not a genius. And the word not goes, 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 goes to the, the right, as big as the subject is. This is because you can insert material within a material within a material. You can say, Mary says that Peter, John, that Peter thinks that John behaves, that John hopes that Mary believes, and so on and so forth. So encapsulating sentences ad infinitum. And when you do this, the first and the last words can be expanded as much as your memory can hold it. So now I gave you two things. The heart of human syntax, this infinite procedure, Second, I gave you the recipe for impossible languages. And now I will take you in the 40 minutes that remains toward a tour between language and the brain, trying to see if Babel is really true or if there are limits 
that constrain the format of a human language in more or less the same way as other biological properties we have are. There are two paths um, when, we, when it comes to understanding um, cognitive capacities in the brain, at least two paths. The first one, we want to know where neurons fire. Fire is a technical word to, to say that they're active. Where in the brain they're active. Do you remember Tantan's brain? So, for example, we knew that that was a position in the left frontal um, gyrus that was connected with language. But this is not the only thing. And the last thing that I'm going to say today is a very advanced result that nowadays is being analyzed all over the world with a very intense research. And that is, what do neurons fire? That is, if I'm a neuron and I'm involved in language computation, what do I say to the other neuron close to me? Do neurons have their own language? Of course they have, it is electricity, but... Okay, so let me take you first through the first path. That is the where problem, which I subtitled uh, the enigma of impossible languages. So, um, the question that I, the, the thing, I, I, what I like to do is to try to offer you a single case study, which is better. I mean, when you go to conferences like this, I mean, I've, very, I've been very in, in, impressed by the program and the inauguration. I feel not at ease with the colleagues that have been invited with me here. So, uh, but uh, what I decided to do is rather than give you a systematic ex cathedra interpretation of things, is give you a couple of case study so that anyone can should be able to formulate new questions. So the question I would like to start with is the following. Why aren't conceivable syntactic rules realized in the languages of the world? That is, why aren't there languages where not can be inserted as a third word? Why is it there nesting? Remember the sentence that I was reading in the first part of the talk. That is, this question amounts to asking whether, to whether this is due to a conventional arbitrary cultural artifact or whether it is related to the neurobiology of the brain structure. And remember, again, once more, I'm talking about syntactic rules. Well, there could be a very simple-minded answer. That is, uh, the paleontological explanation. One could say, well, one possible and kind of an interesting explanation is to assume that similarities are the consequence of the common origin of humans. That is, this map is valid. It's interesting, this map, because now, for the first time, I find myself in a point of the map that I always alluded to when I give talks around. I'm in Chile, finally. So you see there, uh, this is a map that was distributed at the New York uh, Museum of Natural History. And, and it, it's all, actually, it's already old, because nowadays the date has been lowered. So it says, we are all cousins. Even if at Christmas time we don't meet so many people, we were all born by a couple in Africa, in uh, Western Africa, and then we migrated all over the world, reaching Australia and Chile as the last uh, stops of this very long, fantastic train. And the one possibility could be the following: the first language did not have, did have nesting. All the other languages are created by similarity to the first one, so they inherit the property, and so you don't find any non-nesting languages. Well, if that is true, we said, I mean, this is the fact. But of course, there could be another possibility. And the other possibility is to explore how the brain reacts to languages which are impossible. And now by impossible, I mean that do not include the nesting structures. Actually, what we do is we do the same thing as linguists have all done during the centuries, with the only difference that although comparison has been the paradigmatic method nowadays, the new strategy is to test the brain reaction to possible, that is hierarchical nesting, versus impossible linear synthetic rules. Um, I had the, you know, 
the fortune to do three experiments with three different groups of people. One was done in Zurich, in Switzerland, uh, and Marco Tetamati, a younger colleague of mine, was the one who implemented the experiment in 2001. The other one was done in Iena and Hamburg in Germany with Maria Cristina Musso was the one who implemented the experiment. And the third one was done in San Raffaele, Milano in 2009. I have decided to um, illustrate you one single case. The next two slides. So what we did was the following. We chose a group of people that were German. The reason why they were German has nothing to do with, you know, Deutschland per se. It has to do with the fact that there was a part of Europe, that is the Democratic Republic, that under you know, the, um, the fascist control, people could not be exposed to other languages. The first thing that um, tyranny does is to eliminate differences. And eliminate languages is perhaps the straightforward way to try to control people's mind. So what they did was expose the German only to German. They could not even hear the Beatles song, but on a radio. Then we taught them Italian and Japanese, micro Italian and micro Japanese, let's say like 12 nouns, 12 verbs, particles, a few tenses. And while teaching them these languages, we included rules that were impossible. What were these rules? These are the type. This is kind of, you know, I don't want to go through the detail. But to show you, for example, we told that, that Paolo mangia la pera. To negate it, we have, in Italian, we say Paolo mangia la no pera. That is, no is always the fourth word of the sentence. Of course, it is not. And actually, interestingly enough, we never told these German people that Italian is, doesn't work like that. So it's kind of scary. If you find anyone speaking Italian like this, please give him a call. We have to, um, you know, interrupt this thing. Same thing with Japanese. Paova nashinae o taberu. That um, element, um, nai, is to be considered to be, you know, the negation element. And then, then you give you the results. So, we measure two things. On the one hand, we wanted to measure the accuracy. So, we put these people inside of a brain scan and we wanted to see if the linguistic circuit was activated. In particular, of the linguistic circuit, we still look at Broca's area. Not because that's the linguist center of linguistic capacity. There is no center in the brain. It's always a network. But it's an important network. So we look at what happened in Broca's area while learning micro-Italian and micro-Japanese. So if you are on this side, you get a zero at your classwork. If you're on that side, you get a very high um, evaluation. On the other hand, we wanted to see what happened to the activity in Broca's area. And we did so by measuring the amount of blood that was recalled in that area. And we got the following results. The first one is perfectly understandable. With possible rules, that is rules that included nesting, the better you are, the more you have blood called up to Broca's area to make the machinery work. With impossible rules, we obtain the best of all possible results for a neuroscientist. That is, we observe an inversion. The better you get with impossible rules, the less blood circulates and activates Broca's area. So in other terms, the, the brain already knew what linguists discovered later. That is, that there are certain rules that do not belong to the human grammars that are outside our capacity of computation. It was as if one studied gastronomy. People can eat different things, but we cannot drink gasoline. I mean, not willingly, but maybe we drink it someday. But uh, there is a margin of variation, but there is a boundary. 
When it comes to digestion, it's very easy to accept. When it comes to language, a syntactic rule. You know, what is at stake there is humanity. I mean, the definition of, of what a human, is, a human mind is. So it's more difficult. But at least when it comes to syntax, it was clear one thing, and this is the summary of the word problem. The absence of non-recursive languages cannot be considered a mere historical accident, nor a cultural or conventional fact. This fact must correlate with the functional structure of the human brain because brain circuits can certainly not be activated on the basis of a cultural convention. That is, you cannot wake up one morning and say, women use left part of the brain, men the right, and on the other day they turn it upside down. I mean, turn it. I mean, if you look at language from this perspective, a biological perspective, very many questions come to mind. One is pertains to abundance and nature. Uh, since all children can learn any language with no effort in the same amount of time, we must all be endowed with the capacity to learn any language. Any language. That is, in particular, nature gives us many more languages in our mind than we may encounter in our life or than have ever been realized in the history of the world. Our capacity is to understand languages, not Martian languages. But the amount of languages we can understand is, by large, much greater than the one that appear on the planet. In a biological system, this should not be completely surprising. Why is it so? Because of sneezing. Let me tell you what I mean here. If I talk to a friend of mine, I move the air and the air goes through the ear and is interpreted. If I sneeze on a friend of mine, first of all, I give, uh, you know, I give a slap on my face. But then your body has to interpret the sneezing. What does it mean, interpret the sneezing? Not the sound of a sneezing. It has to interpret the, anti the antigens that are contained in the sneezing itself. And what we know now is that we are endowed with an abundant repertoire of antibodies which may contest diseases that we will never be exposed to. The person who started this idea that our immune system is like learning grammar said this following thing. I find it astonishing that the immune system embodies a degree of complexity that suggests some more or less superficial, though striking analogies with the human language. And this person was Irene, and he got the Nobel Award for this single idea. And the talk he gave in Stockholm was a generative grammar for the immune system. So he said, if Chomsky is right, on saying that our brain contains more grammar than we know, then maybe our immune system works in the same way. And it was partially right, and people in Stockholm believed him and gave him this prize. Not that the prizes count a lot. I mean, one can be right without any prize, luckily enough. But uh, it's always nice when someone thinks of what you say. And now let's go to the second part. That is the what problem. Remember, in the first part, what I did was the following. I was asking, what in the brain is activated? And I use a notion that was made by linguists, that is, Babel has boundaries. The boundaries are the format of rules. There are no rules that cannot contain, there are no languages that cannot have this recursive ad infinitum containment. And that was an interesting question. The far more interesting and difficult question now is to ask, not only which part of the brain is activated, but what is the code that the neurons use to communicate with one another? Because what is at stake here is that we want to understand if the format of the grammars that are spoken in the world are the expression of some physical property 
of what of how we are construed. This is a very, very difficult thought. It's a brand new one. I decided to discuss it here today with you because, um, because I think that people who attend to this kind of events, like the festival um, Porto de Ides de Valparaíso, are people, it, it, I mean, if you are here in such a beautiful day, it means that you do care about ideas, really. And so I wanted to share this with you, although its imperfection will be clear. Uh, there is a first question I want to ask you. What is language made of? I do this as a trick in first class, first hour to my students. I always ask them, what is language made of? You know, those students who want to show up say, language is made of sounds and meanings. And I say, okay, I mean, what is it made of? And so someone else comes up and say, it's made of syllables and morphemes. No, no, I really want to know what it's made of. And they get lost. Because I ask them, I want to know what language is made of in the same sense that I'm asking what is this thing made of. And of course language is made of two things. There is a communication that is the waves that goes from my mouth. In fact, I have the microphone. But even if I didn't have the microphone, you would hear me. So the microphone is irrelevant. And then there is something that happens from your ear to the brain, which is supposedly not air. I mean, you may have, but. <laughs> so if you ask what is the stuff language is made of, and you see how PowerPoint evolved. Because from a physical point of view, language consists of waves, air waves, sound outside us, or electric waves, that is the neural activity inside us. To be honest, there is a third kind of wave that is involved. And you're seeing it on the screen, that is writing. Even when language is written, it consists of life, which is also a wave. But let's disregard a writing system and reading, because for two reasons. Because this comes after in the human evolution and comes after in the evolution of children. So language, writing and reading is very interesting, but has, it comes after the structure of language itself. So you see, um, when I was a young student, I had to uh, translate a book by Noam Chomsky. It contained one single sentence that to me, I mean, it changed my life. I actually organized, um, an event, a symposium with this single sentence. The sentence was the following. He said, it is important to be surprised by simple facts. This very gem, in my mind, is perhaps one of the most interesting sentences I've ever heard. Incidentally, last night at the inauguration, um, I did not understand the entire thing, but there was one single sentence by the poet that was considered there, that impressed me a lot. If the death of a ch child has no sense, then nothing has sense. This is really touching. I mean, there is so much humanity in this single sentence. And this had the same impact on me that this sentence by Noam Chomsky had. And what I do when I do my everyday life in research is try to find the simple things. If I'm surprised or not, it's not up to me to decide. I have to be smart. If I'm not, I'm not. But on the other hand, if you prepare the scenario in that way, the question comes out in a sort of automatic way. Because the question now here is, uh, how similar are the waves, the sound waves and the electric waves corresponding to a certain linguistic expression, you know. So if I say, sono a Valparaíso, you receive the sound, and your brain, the ear, transmit an electric waves that correspond to sono a Valparaíso. Where is the similarity between the two? To understand this, I worked with a totally different team, in this case, neurosurgeons. Um, there is a new frontier in neurolinguistics, in fact, that is based on a possibility. I mean, it's not a, a, a nice event, but when people have a brain tumor and they have to be treated, one, you know, 
the surgeon has to open the skull to extract the tumor. One of the things he does not want to do is to cut part of the brain that contains some path of information because when the brain is closed, then the patient may not be able to perform that task. So one of the things that was done, and that was done especially um, um, that was done especially by a medical doctor many years ago in Seattle, Ojem, and I will show you the picture of a book which is very interesting, is the following thing. You take the patient, you make them sleep, you open the skull, and you open the skull in the position of the brain where you're supposed to get the tumor out. Then you wake him up and you ask him or her to perform some activity that is connected with the brain, part of the brain that is exposed. In the same time, with a pointer, you touch the surface of the brain, and when by touching a point, the task is interrupted, like for example, giving name to objects. You see a glass and say glass, you see a window, you say window. If you're touching a point, you say, then you know you cannot cut there, because otherwise the patient will be damaged. But on the other hand, since it is exposed, you can actually measure the electric activity of the brain. So you practically do this thing. You, po you, you pose a grid over the portion of the brain and you try to understand the electric activity or the ways that the neuron use to exchange each other the information. Now, to cut a long story short, this is the book that I don't know if in, in, in Britain this is, a, this is a, a book that circulated, The Conversation with Neil's Brain. I have tried to make it translated to in Italy, but I did not succeed in that. The, brain, I think, the, the, the book, I think, was very useful. But then let, let me tell you what we did. Remember, the basic question is the following. I want to compare waves, sound waves with electric waves. We started from a point that we already knew, of course, as always in science. You never start from scratch. We know that when some information gets inside of your brain, it preserves the structure of the information. In fact, in the case of sound, we perfectly know that there are areas of the brain where the form of the electric waves preserve the information of the sound. Otherwise, if I say mamma or Valparaiso, you would have the same pattern, which is not true, because you want to know that mamma is different from Valparaiso because of the sound, of the, of the sound and then has to be interpreted in the brain. And in, an even more interesting fact was that part of the information was found not only in the part of the brain that computes sound, but also in those that compute grammar. This is the more sophisticated citation that I have. The second part is important. Electric waves preserving sound shapes are also present in Broca's area. The electric examination of electric activity, electrocorticogram is the electric activity, the measurement of electric activity recorded during language perception show this. And then we were at the point of deciding the simple experiment we wanted to have. And the surprising fact, being part of the Catholic country, was the present of a saint. You're supposed to laugh, because if you don't, <laughs> I'm in danger. No, <laughs> okay. This is, this guy was doing something very strange in medieval time, something that people were not really supposed to do. Another person, seeing him doing this, wrote this sentence. When Ambrose, Saint Ambrose, read, his eyes scanned the page and his heart sought out the meaning, but his voice was silent and his tongue was still. He was doing something strange, that is, he was reading in his mind. We actually, these words are by St. Augustine, who is buried in my hometown. That doesn't matter, but maybe, you know, <laughs> getting closer to the saints, you have better ideas. That. And so what we did was a very, very simple experiment that to me opened, really opened a new world. That is, well actually it's called endophasia, the activity of not only reading, but thinking in your mind. Actually, let me make a very simple experiment with you now. If I stop talking for five seconds, and you think about something, just to 
I want you to, to think of what you're doing, let's say. You had thoughts. And while having thinking, while thinking, you not only thought about concepts, you gave them the sound that you would use to communicate to the people around you. Is it necessary? Actually not. We could have been evolved in a way that when we speak in ourselves, we just avoid referring to sound. But it is not. So what we did was the following experiment. Remember, we did the following thing. We asked patients, in fact, notice that we, 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 the experiment was done with 16 patients. Normally, paper in this field are published with one or two patients, but we thought we had a wrong measurement. So we went on for two years measuring these things. We, the, exper the setting of the experiment was the following. The people had to read something aloud. So, for example, they had to read Sono Valparaiso. And then we compared the sound waves and the electric waves. And according to actually what was already discovered, the sound waves and um, the electric waves were similar. And then we asked them to read that things in their mind without producing any sound. We wanted to be sure, so we put, you know, microphone all over, myographical apparatuses, and everything to be sure that they were not sub-rehearsing the sound. And then, practically, we wanted to see what happens when the sound stays in. And this is the first graph. It's a complicated mathematics. I don't want you to trust me in terms of a complete bona fide attitude, but I want you to rely on the fact that in mathematics sometimes the shape of graphs is revealing. So if you look at that thing, this is the shape of the graph when you're reading aloud, and this is the shape of the graph when you're reading silently. The result is that practically the shape of the electric waves when reading silently is the same as when reading aloud, not in the auditory area, but in Broca's area. In other words, we think there could be a new path for understanding grammar that is to exploit the fact that sound is anyway exploited to convey the computation that pertains to language. Notice one important thing. One could say, well, maybe you have been wrong about Broca's area. Maybe Broca's area, everything he does is compute something pertaining to sound. And then I put another um, element in the experiment. We compared the similarity of sound and electricity with single words and with full sentences. Of course, the single word had to be very long, like precipitevolissime volmente, and a single sentence had to be very short, like arrivo qui, because the number of syllables had to be compared. And what we obtained was a very interesting result. That is, disregarding the nature of, the, of this graph, words and sentences behave differently. That is, the, brain, the correlation between sound and the electric waves is different when it comes to words or when it comes to sentences. In other terms, it's not only sound, it's already grammar that it is there. Um, as a summary of the what problem, we could say, this is the paper that came out um, in the proceeding of the National Academy of Science in, in January last year. Knowing that sound information is preserved even when no sound is produced, should be exploited to understand the properties of human syntax and build another wall that characterizes the boundaries of Babel that contain all human languages. If we use sound, even, if, even when we do not need it, then it would be hardly the case that the sound structure does not have any impact on the structure of grammar. Of course, what we discovered is dangerous but it's dangerous when you invent a knife. You can use a knife to, you know, to cut salami or you kill uh, someone. 
um, and it's, you know, it can be used to help patients with language impairment. There could be certain types of patients with certain kind of aphasia where you can actually reach the, th the, reach the linguistic content before it is damaged by an apparatus that doesn't work in a proper way. But of course, you can imagine a world with a kind of policy where people can access thoughts that people do not want to reveal. I mean, unless you learn that when you open your brain, you have to, let's say, count from a one to a hundred, or, you know, having your mind, la vispa Teresa Correa Albeta, cercando su presa. I don't know if you have any vispa Teresa. <laughs> They're doing the most amazing work in the job in the world. Yes, yes, yes. Translating the two languages. This is a, it's a mystery, and you're doing it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is the always Jekyll Hyde effect. You can use invention. I mean, scientists should be neutral. Before leaving you, I just want to address another last question. I mean, as I said before, it seems to me that the value of a theory is not in the number of answers that it gives, but the number of questions, of new questions that it allows. Are there new questions? if we adopt the idea that languages are biologically structured in a non-metaphorical way? Well, this is a very tricky question. There is one thing that I want to tell you, but before saying that thing, I want to remind you a notion which is circulating in biology, at least since the work of Stephen Jay Gould, which is very well known. It's a notion of Acceptation. Acceptation may be a complicated notion, but I think it is very clear if you look at this. Uh, nature may have things that were designed for some use and they were then used for some other function. Uh, this is, it happens all over biology. You know, the way that there were certain insects that developed um, wings that were too small to fly, but nature didn't know that they wanted to fly. So it did not enlarge step by step the, the, the wings in order to let them fly. But the first enlargement that was casual mutation um, made nature prefer larger wings because they were used like fans in very hot places. And then all of a sudden it's like if you're using a fan and you move, you, you, you sort of fly away, but by using un ventaglio, I don't know how to say it in English, but there should be a word. word. Now, honestly speaking, there could be the opposite of acceptation that I, sort of a joke, called the, the cataptation. And to explain how the cataptation works, I use this image. Suppose we are archaeologists of the next millennium. And we find computers, um, or you know, even mobile phones. In our computers, if you look at the lines of letters, for example, in mine, I have a Q W E R T. Why the hell didn't I use the alphabetic order, which would be simple? And we know, we understand, we learn alphabet when we are kids, after all. So we already know A, B, C, D, F, G, A, B, C, D. In all languages, there is an alphabetic order. Why didn't they use it? There was a reason for that. When they started to use the first typewriters, had an alphabetic order. But when you pushed on one element, the hammer was not so fast to come back before pushing the other, the other hammer was moving. So I already, I actually experienced it in my youth using for the first time a typewriter was a mess because all the hammer were jumping together and I had to clean myself and I was a mess of more than the text at the end. So engineers decided to separate those letters that were more frequent and close so that you, did, you, you avoided the jamming of hammers. But now, if you look at my computer now, I don't want to move it because you never know, but if you look at the computer now, there is no hammering, there is no, nothing moves, I mean, electron moves, and the little pressure of your fingers over the typing, or if you use these kind of things, you don't, you don't even move the pressure of the, the element of the key on, on the note. 
But nevertheless, we still use the QWERTY, Q W E R T type, type um, layout. Why is it so? Well, because it could be too expensive, in a metaphorical sense, to produce new machines that run against something that we now learn for sure that corresponded to a different function before. And if it is so, that is, if when we find some regularity, that regularity responded to something that was useful before, how do we know that the property of human languages are useful for something we need now? And by now, I mean two nows. The now at, in the history of humanity and the now in the history of every single individual as a person. After all, nature may have very unexpected changes, especially in the body. There is one single case that I want to uh, highlight here. When we were kids, we had different teeth, milk teeth. Denti da latte. I don't know if in Spanish you say the same thing. And then all, all of a sudden they, you know, they fall, up, fall down and you have a new set of teeth. Is that because, of course, you say, well, that's because you use the teeth and you need a new teeth. But, well, that does not happen with the, with the eye. I don't have milk eyes. And I could have, actually. One eye could pop down and then create. Why didn't nature give us, um, you know, give us milk eyes? And... Did nature give us milk grammars? We don't know. So understanding the property of a language now cannot be connected to the function that they have insofar as similar things happen in nature and cannot be reconnected because we are lost the reason. Uh, to finish, I just want to uh, go back to my original. I was trained, my first degree in, in, in Italy was in Greek and Latin. I transferred to mathematics and the brain soon, but uh, I was very interested in that. And I always had in mind the frustrating image of the turtle and Achilles. I never understood why Achilles cannot do this. Keep the turtle. I mean, come on, you're Achilles. It's a turtle. You just go there. Well, and my idea is that the turtle is to Achilles as language is to humans. We can never really reach it, but with the help of everybody in this room, in this planet, in all the university, I think we can get close enough to look at the turtle directly in his eyes. Since we're close to Christmas, let me thank you for this. Thank you.